start with that song. All right, we'll we'll start together. Welcome in a call to worship. Oh, he's coming. He's coming. Well, hello, welcome here. Feel free to come on in and find your seats. How's everyone doing today? Pretty good. How's everyone doing today? Hey, look at that. We're alive. It's kind of sunny out. The weather can't make up its mind. Well, welcome here. My name is Sean. I'm one of the pastors at Brookswood Church, and I'm excited that you guys have joined us uh, for worship today. Special welcome to those of you who are online. Um, if you are new and visiting us, uh, we'd love to get to know you. And the best way to do that is to fill out a Connect card. Uh, either the Connect card in the pew in front of you and drop it in the offering box in the lobby. Or you can go online to our website at brookswoodbaptist.com slash I'm new. That's I am dash new. Fill out the digital Connect card and someone will be in touch with you later this week. Our call to worship this morning uh, is an, uh, adapted from Lamentations 3, and it goes like this. Your steadfast love, Lord, never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. So let us proclaim, great is your faithfulness, great is your love, great is your mercy, and greatly is your name to be praised. Let me pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful that once again we can gather uh, as a family to worship you. And Father, we thank you that each one of us is here by grace. We haven't earned our way here through our good behavior. In fact, God, we were rebels against you, and yet you were merciful to us. So Father, for your grace, we are just so thankful. And Father, I recognize that each one of us comes into the room today, whether online or in person, with a lot of junk in our lives. A lot of pain, physical and emotional. A lot of relationships where there's been breakdown and hurt. And God, you know every single one of our struggles. And God, you're the only one who is capable of meeting us in the midst of them and lifting our eyes towards you. And so God, I pray that today you would meet each person in this room in exactly the way that we need to be met. And we ask that as we pray and sing and open your word, God, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bring healing and would bring hope and would bring new life to each one of us. And God, I pray that as a result, we would praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Brookswood Church. Uh, my name is Connor. I'm one of the worship leaders here. And it's a privilege to be able to worship with you guys this morning. So I would love to invite you to stand with us if you're able. And uh, now we get some worship. Thank you. 
my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, and I
sing a verse from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is enduring as the heavens. All heavens will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord? What mightiest angel is anything like the Lord? The highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is more awesome than all who surround his throne. O Lord, God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. Well, this time I'd like to release uh, all the kids, age three to grade five, 
head down to their Kid Street classrooms, go down the long hall, and a volunteer will be there to check you in. A couple of announcements. Uh, one big thank you to those of you who participated and volunteered to help uh, us out at the Brookswood Village Summer Fest yesterday. Uh, handing out water bottles and running the kids' table, amongst other things. Um, I heard it went really, really well. So thank you, Pastor Pamelina and those who volunteered with her to represent the church and serve our community. And I just appreciate you guys getting out there and um, building relationships with people. Number two, we have a second opportunity to do this, which is this coming Saturday, June 11th, is the return of our annual garage sale. We've been talking about this for a, a few weeks now. Uh, but just so you know, there are plenty of volunteer spaces available. So we still need help with uh, setup and cleanup. We put out, you know, like 90 tables uh, for vendors to set up at, and so we could use some help with that. We got a system, though, and uh, we got Kurt Jackson in charge of that. He's in our, uh, teaching our kids right now, but he'll be here on the day to help with that. We also need help running the concession stand, um, helping out with the barbecue. We're making hot dogs. Um, and other people who want to simply uh, put on one of our Here to Serve Brookswood Church t-shirts and walk around and be a friendly face and represent the church and just welcome people and say hi and build relationships with people. So if you're at all interested in volunteering, there are clipboards in the lobby. Simply put your name uh, and email down there and then we'll email you back this week with instructions on how you can get involved. Um, and like I said last week, if you have uh, any old junk, I mean really quality used goods that you would like to <laughs> sell at a reasonable price, we have tables available, and we can actually use more vendors as well to fill this thing out coming back from COVID. So uh, if you want to take up a table with your five items even and just uh, <laughs> make some space uh, look like it's filled up so this can be a, a, a boisterous, fun event, we would welcome that as well. So um, you can email uh, office at brookswoodbaptist.com if you want to be a vendor and like a table. And then lastly, uh, our summer camps are coming up. We are in the process of um, hiring some summer interns. We'll have four summer interns this summer, one eight-week intern, uh, intern and three six-week uh, interns that will help us uh, run our summer camps. So we've got a half-day basketball camp, half-day soccer camp, and a full-day kind of a classic VBS or day camp that we're running last two weeks of July, first week of August. Um, and we're also looking for volunteers. So if you're in high school um, and you want to volunteer, or if you're a senior citizen and you want to volunteer, or if you're anywhere in between, uh, we would love to have you, and you can contact me for that. So Sean, S-E-A-N, at brookswoodbaptist.com. Let me pray for this morning's offering and uh, for Pastor Pamelina as she's about to open God's word for us. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you again that you are a God of unconditional love. God, we thank you that we don't worship as as many think, a, a mean, little, angry God. <laughs> but we worship a God of humility and love who laid down his life for us. So God, we are just, again, so thankful for your grace. We're, thank you, we're also thankful it doesn't stop there, though. Not only did you die for us and forgive our sins, but... Today on Pentecost Sunday, we get to celebrate the fact that you gave us the ultimate gift, the gift of yourself in the person of the Holy Spirit. And God, we need you desperately. And so we thank you that those of us who have placed our faith in you, we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit when we were born again. But God, we ask that you would do a fresh work of the Spirit in our lives. God, we ask that every day, but we ask it especially today just because of the symbolism of it being Pentecost Sunday. So God, as Pastor Pamelina opens up your word in the book of Jude for our new sermon series, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be tangibly felt in this room. Not so that we can say we felt you, but so that you could make a change in our lives. That we would become more aware and broken over our sin, but also more aware of your tremendous love and grace for us. And Father, I pray that in response to this grace and this great salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we would respond through our giving of tithes and offerings today. God, would you use that money to multiply gospel ministry around the world to our missionaries and to those of us who are missionaries right here in Brookswood. God, I pray for the kids as they meet in their classrooms. God, 
would you let them experience your love through the teachers? And God, would the gospel be clearly explained at a level that is age-appropriate for them, that they would come to understand that Jesus loves them and died for them? And God, we pray for the garage sale this coming Saturday. This is a fun time, but it's not just a fun time. This is also about loving and serving our community. It's also about building favor with our community that there might be an inroad, a bridge made, so that the gospel could go forth. So that people who do not yet know that they were created by a God who loves them could come to know that they were created by a God who loves them and sent his son to die for them. So God, would you take our little efforts and would you multiply them to feed the thousands? Empower Pastor Pamela as she opens your word in the next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, I am on. I am loud. Welcome to our Pentecost Sunday. This is always a fun Sunday to remind it of just how uh, blessed we are to have the Holy Spirit living in us, working through us, and keeping us with God. Pastor Sean was away this week, and so I was left in charge of the church. <laughs> and I was sorely tempted to title our, our new sermon series, Hey Jude. <laughs> but that would have been too easy. And so I've gone with the more appropriate title, The Book of Jude, Contend for the Faith. Do you know what it's like to have your original plans hijacked? To have planned your day out, minute by minute, hour by hour, knowing exactly where you're supposed to be, who you're meeting with, and what you're doing. But then have some emergency pop up, and you have to pivot at a moment's notice. I imagine this is what parents feel like all the time. I feel like I got a small taste of this when I was visiting home a few years ago, and my sister decided to take advantage of my free time and have me drive her kids to their my gym appointments every morning for a week. Now, my gym is totally fun. It's like gymnastics for little kids. Uh, but every morning I would wake up, I would try to take advantage of my sister's really nice espresso machine and try to make myself a coffee. But without fail, Kai would lose a sock, or Katie couldn't find her bag, or snacks were missing, and we had to like get out to the car and go. And so every day for a week, my brother-in-law and my sister were coming home to finding their espresso machine in pieces all over the house, because it was just left wherever I dropped it. I never seemed to be able to follow through with my original plan here, and they made fun of me accordingly. This need to pivot to address an emergency is actually at the heart of Jude. See, Jude had originally planned to write a completely different letter, but when he had heard of the false teaching that was infiltrating the, his intended audience, he pivoted and switched gears to write a letter of warning and encouragement instead. This book is short but dense, so we are gonna be taking a bit of a scenic route, and over three weeks, we will be going into a deep dive into what Jude had to say to his original audience and what he has to say to us today. Jude really is such an odd little epistle. It is the penultimate book of the Bible, which is just a fancy way of saying that it is the second to last book of the Bible. And it is one of the least read books of the Bible. Because even though it is so short, it is also so weird. Epistles or letters like Jude are what we call occasional in nature. And this means that we, as modern readers of the Bible, we are eavesdropping on a one-sided conversation that happened 2,000 years ago. We only have Jude's letter. We don't have the letter that was sent to Jude to tell him about the situation that was happening. And we don't have the letter of response from the church to the letter that Jude sent. And so we have to take a careful look at the historical and cultural context and look in the letter itself to find clues as to what Jude is addressing and why it is important to us. So today I'm going to be covering the first four verses of Jude. 
I know you guys are super excited to be spending the next 30 minutes covering four verses. So strap in, because we're going to be spending most of it in verse one. So let us read the first four verses. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So like any good epistle written around the first century, the letter begins with who the author of the letter is and then who the letter is addressed to. Jude 1.1 1, 1 says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. From this part, we know the author calls himself a servant of Christ, which is, should, be sim that should be familiar to many of us. Both Paul and Peter and James all start their letters this way, calling themselves a servant of Christ. The next part is where things become a little more interesting. He also calls himself a brother of James. Now, most modern Bible scholars take James to be James, the half-brother of Jesus, and the author of the epistle of James. If this is the case, then Jude is also one of Jesus' half-brothers, who was named in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. When people heard Jesus preaching in their hometown, they said this, it's not there. He says, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? It is there. Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So in my research of Jude, this was really interesting. I discovered that Jude's Greek and Hebrew name is actually Judah, which appears as Judas in this verse here. But in order not to confuse Jude with Judah, the, the patriarch, one of Jacob's 12 sons, and not to confuse him with Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus, they named, they named him Jude. I personally feel like this effort to make names less confusing in the Bible just makes things more confusing. So other scholars also say that it is possible that Jude is actually Thaddeus, one of the 12 disciples, who was given the nickname Thaddeus so that he wouldn't be confused with Judas Iscariot. The lesson in all of this is that nobody wanted to be confused with Judas. And unfortunately, Judas was a very popular name in the first century. The biblical scholars that I read the most and trust the most all believe that this epistle is written by Jude, the half-brother of James, and they provide sound evidence and logic behind this claim, so I find myself in agreement with them. Now, with that understanding that the author of Jude is the half-brother of Jesus, it is interesting to note that both James and Jude do not call themselves brothers of the Lord. In other places of the New Testament, other people have called them that, but they do not claim that title themselves. There is a humbleness and a modesty to the way they've chosen to self-identify. That instead of calling themselves brothers of Christ, which would have possibly given them more influence in the growing church, they instead refer to themselves as his servants. We know that during Jesus' three years of public ministry, his family, including Jude and James, did not support him and even tried to stop him at times. But from church history, from Acts and other epistles, we know that after Jesus came back from the dead and ascended to heaven, his brothers became actively involved in his ministry. Jude writes his letter to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And this is the passage I actually want to spend most of our time in today. Jude packs a powerful message into these simple lines but first, we're going to look at the other two verses so we can get some historical context and come back to it in a minute. So verse three and four says this. 
Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge to you to contend for the faith that once for all entrusted to, God, to God's holy people. Although we do not know who the intended audience that Jude is writing to, or even the location of this church, we do know that it was a group of people who are familiar with the Old Testament history. So it was most likely a group of Jews who had come to believe that Jesus was their Messiah. Jude describes his intended audience as dear friends. This is not a community of believers that he's unfamiliar with. These are people he spent time with, he had broken bread with, and he had shared and taught the gospel to them. This relationship that he shares with them is what gives him this desire to write a pastoral letter a teaching letter that would celebrate the salvation that they share together. However, when Jude hears of the heresy that is happening in the church and how it's impacting this community that he loves, he sets aside the original idea and writes a letter of warning and encouragement instead. And it actually sounds like Jude doesn't want to write this letter at all. The NIV says he felt compelled to write to urge them. The NRSV says, I find it necessary to write and to appeal to you. This wasn't a letter that Jude wanted. But out of his love for this community, he went for it. We have this tendency to define God's unconditional love for us by how we want to be loved, which is unconditional acceptance and celebration. That no matter what I do or what sins I commit, God will always love me. Jude touches upon this in verse 4. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. They believe that God's grace is a permission to live however they want. The problem that this church faced almost 2,000 years ago are not so different than the problems we face today. People who call themselves Christians and say they love God, but want nothing to do with God's authority. They want the kingdom of God without acknowledging that God is the king in all aspects of their lives. See, it is true that God is love, and it's true that he loves us unconditionally, because that is God's grace. We do not need to do anything or strive to reach some standard to have God love us. Romans 8, 38 to 39 says this from Paul. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor in the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, not anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is true that there is nothing we can do or say that will ever change how much God loves us and how he sees us. It is true that, God's loves, that God loves us just the way we are. But it is also true that God loves us too much to leave us where we are. See, no one really has a problem with God loving them. The problem is that a lot of us also want to continue to have full control of our lives and we want to live as we want to live. Being loved by God is great, but submitting to his will, submitting to his discipline, not so great. Loving someone doesn't mean letting them do whatever they want. God's love for us means that he desires our highest good. And the highest good means confronting the choices in our life that lead to death instead of life and life in abundance. So for Jude, this means he's confronting the false teaching that has infiltrated the church community. And it is the unconditional love for them that compels him to write this difficult letter. See, no one wants to be the person to confront a loved one or a friend on, the, on their bad choices. Because it is hard and it is uncomfortable and it often leads to tensions within the relationship that are hard to get over. Sometimes you know that your criticism will not be taken well. That the brother or sister in Christ that you are talking to will be resistant. 
and I imagine that the community that was receiving Jude's letter, there were people there who did not want to hear it from Jude. Yet this is what needs to happen in our lives. We need our Christian brothers and sisters to journey with us in life and help each other stay on the narrow path. Now that we know who the author of Jude is and the purpose behind his letter, let us now turn our attention to who he is writing this letter to. So Jude 1, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. In other epistles, this is usually the place where the author will indicate the recipient of the letter, and that tends to give us a lot of information about who the letter is going to and where it is going. In Romans, Paul writes, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. That's pretty direct. You're in Rome and you are loved by God. The epistle of James was written to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So he's writing to the Jewish tribes scattered abroad. First Timothy, Paul addresses his letter to Timothy, his true son in the faith. Jude apparently likes to be very difficult because he does not do any of this. Instead, he addresses his letter to those who have been called, who have been loved and kept. These three adjectives, called, loved, and kept, are what I want us to focus on this morning because they are great descriptions of the foundations of our Christian life. First, let us start off with called. It is no accident that you and I are here. We who call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ, are only here because we responded to God's love on our lives. That means that at some point in our life, God got our attention and did not let go. Some of us were five years old and sitting in Sunday school class when a teacher told us about the love of Jesus and we, we got to respond. Some of us were well into our adult years and life circumstances force us to reckon with God's place in our life. For some, God got our attention through a still, small voice. And for others, it was as subtle as a punch to the face. For some of us, faith came as easy as breathing. And for others, it took years of intentional study and research before we could take a step of faith. Regardless of how or when, God pursued us. He got our attention and we responded to his invitation by accepting the gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. If you are someone here today, though, and you're not sure about God's call in your life, let me be a punch to your face this morning. 2 Timothy 1, chapter, uh, verse 9, said he, sa he had saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purposes and grace the grace that was given in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. God planned this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 14. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are called. God is calling you to him. He is calling you to be forgiven He's calling you to be set free from sin. He's calling you to live a life filled with purpose and to have life and life in abundance. You are called. Have no doubt about that. Your choice now is whether or not you choose it. The second part, you are loved by God. The Koine Greek word here that Jude uses is agape menois. I have no idea if I said that right. Nope. Wendell says nope. <laughs> it is translated in English as beloved. We are the beloved of God the Father. This Greek verb, though, is very particular. This is the perfect tense in Greek, 
which carries two ideas. One, that it is a completed action that took place in the past. And the effects of this action is ongoing. So if something happened, it is done. But because this thing happened, there are things happening now. So Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God proved his love to us that while we were still sinners, he still chose to, rec to rescue us. For Jude, his original audience, and for ourselves today, we see Jesus' death as a completed action that happened in the past. For them, it was like 60 years in the past. For us, 2,000 years in the past. It does not matter, though, because the effects of that action still go on today. The, completed, the effects of the completed action is our salvation, which includes our ongoing sanctification and our future glorification. God's offer of salvation, our adoption to his family as sons and daughters, is proof of his love because he has already died for us. Being loved by God also means that God always desires our highest good. So when he blesses us, that is for our highest good. When he says wait or says no to a heart's desire, that is for our highest good. When he allows us to suffer the consequences of our sins or the consequences of other people's sins, that can also be used for our highest good. We may not agree with God about the things that happen to us, but we can trust that God's love for us and his character, that nothing that happens to us goes unnoticed by him or can't be used by him to draw us closer to him. So let us be clear about what our highest good is not. It is not happiness, it is not wealth, health, power, or fame. Our highest good is the ongoing sanctification. This is us becoming more like Christ in our daily lives. It is our future glorification, the promise that we will one day share in Jesus' glory when all things are made new. And how do we know that we are, we are reaching God's highest good for us? That is in Jude chapter 1, verse 2. We know this when we experience mercy and peace and love in abundance. The third thing that we are looking at is that you are kept for Jesus Christ. So if you've been tracking this verse so far, you can see that the prepositions in this verse are a bit odd. Like kept for Jesus Christ. That's a weird sentence. That's not a sentence we would normally see in everyday English. When something sounds weird in any particular translation of the Bible, I always check other translations first. Translations are an interesting thing because sometimes you can look at three or four different translations and every single one of them are relatively the same. And then sometimes you find verses, like Jude 1, where you look at five different translations, you're like, oh, there are some variations here. So let's take a look. The NIV, which uh, I have been reading from, says, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. The NLT says, I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. The ESV to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. The New King James Version, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. And just for fun, here's the Amplified. To those who are called, so God's chosen ones, or the elect, who are dearly loved by God the Father and kept, so this could also be secure and set apart, for Jesus Christ. See, some translations try to translate the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek word for word. So these are what we call literal translations, where they take the Greek word and they find the closest English equivalent, and they use that. 
And that is where we get uh, translations like the ESV, the English Standard Version. Other translations try to convey the author's meaning. So that's a thought for thought translation. And that's where we get Bibles like the message. Most Bible translations, though, try to balance both approaches, which is why it's useful to just check different translations if something doesn't make sense. And we are so blessed that we write and we read and we speak English because we probably have the most amount of Bible translations out of any language that exists on earth. So looking at these five translations, we get the sense that Jesus is active in our being kept. That it is through Jesus and in Jesus and for Jesus that our faith is kept secure. Philippians 4, 7 speaks to this. And it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 34 says this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. First John calls Jesus our advocate. He is the one who represents us, who pleads for us, who prays for us, and who keeps us. Do you know that him, fount of every blessing, one of the last verses of that song is prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. This hymn is one of my favorite songs because of this one verse. This is our human condition. We are prone to wander and we are prone to leave the God we love. So here is my heart, Jesus. I can't be trusted with it. Take it and seal it and protect it and guard it so I can stay close to you. This means our faith is not our own. And is that not a great comfort? There are seasons of my life where I feel like my faith has run dry. I have nothing left to give. There is no desire to even be in God's presence. Yet in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus tells us, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Because it's not about how much faith we have. It's about the object of our faith. Faith as small as a mustard seed can accomplish miracles because it is anchored in an all-powerful God. One who is invested in keeping you for himself. Your faith is not your own because it is rooted in Jesus Christ himself who will carry our faith even when we feel like we have none. Jude begins his letter with reminding us of who we are. We are called and we are loved and we are kept. He starts this way because it's reminding his original audience of who they are in God. The false teaching that is infiltrating their church is threatening their understanding of who they are. It threatens their ability to be still and to be at rest with God. It threatens to distort their ability to reflect God into the world around them and to shake their foundation. Jude starts his letter this way because we need to be before we can do. Our strength our ability to serve God and serve others comes from knowing who we truly are. It is so often so much easier to just do, to be busy, to be distracted. It is so much harder to just be. Um, a lot of you have heard about the discipleship group that we've, uh, I've been a part of over the past year. And recently, we've just started practicing Lectio Divina, and this is the divine listening. 
and it involves just being with scripture, sitting with the Holy Spirit and with the Bible, and slowly and repetitively reading two or three verses over a period of time. And man, does it not feel like the most unproductive part of my day? Because <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm not serving someone, I'm not fixing a problem, I'm not talking to someone. Yet, as I do it over and over again, I know it is building up in me this ability to be. It is enabling me to be with God and to sit with the Holy Spirit. Only then can I do. Only then can I serve the church. Only then can I lead. Jude begins this letter with who we are, and in a few weeks from now, when we get to the end of the letter Jude, he will tell us where we can go from there. But for now, for this week, my prayer for all of us, we, the children of God, who have the Holy Spirit living and indwelling in us, is to lean into being, to spend time this week reminding ourselves just who we are each and every day so that we can do the work that God has prepared for us to do. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord God, we come before you today thankful for the gift of life that you've given us. Lord, that you've called each of us, that you love each of us, and that you are actively working to keep each of us by your side. Lord, there is nothing special about us. We have nothing to do that we can earn your love or your blessing, but you choose to freely give it, and you call us your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us this week will be able to be to be still in your presence, to rest in your strength, and to be dependent on your provision. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Well, this time, I'd like to invite uh, all of you who have been called, loved, and kept in Christ Jesus to join us in taking the Lord's Supper together. On the way in, you uh, should have received one of these little prepackaged communion cups. And if you didn't, and you'd like to uh, take communion with us this morning, just put your hand up, and one of the ushers will come around and make sure you see have one there. Some on this side, down the front here too. Right there. Um, and as we get started, I want to remind you that uh, once a month, when we do take the Lord's Supper together, we also um, take a special benevolent offering for special financial needs both uh, inside our church and in the community and so if you want to give uh, over and above your regular tithes and offerings to the benevolent fund uh, you can do so by simply writing you know benevolent fund on the envelope and dropping it in the box in the lobby or you can go online uh, to brooksobaptist.com give and select select benevolent from the drop down list of funds that you can give to and the money will be uh, given to that fund everyone have one now the Lord's Supper um, is a beautiful act of worship that was uh, ordained, given to us by Jesus uh, for the spiritual good of his people. Um, and yet, it uh, can lose its effectiveness to a certain extent if we go into it simply by going through the motions or misunderstanding what it is that we are doing when we take the Lord's Supper. And so I just want to share uh, something really quick that I came across that was helpful as a way of kind of getting into the Lord's Supper together today. And there's a book that has been written just recently called Why is the Lord's Supper Important? Um, and it's by a pastor uh, named Dr. Aubrey Sequeira. And he says it's helpful to think about the Lord's Supper in um, sort of five ways, five directions to look when you take the Lord's Supper. And so first he says we look backwards. We are remembering the sacrifice, the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, uh, by which we have received forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. So we look backward, but we also look outward. And so we, when we take the Lord's Supper, we're also celebrating the family bond that has been created um, by sharing in Christ together. We are now brothers and sisters 
together in Christ. We also look upward, and we remember that we are, even though dealing with sin in our lives, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus because we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. And we look to him this morning as uh, for nourishment, for our hungry hearts, and for strength. And we receive that, uh, that grace when we take the Lord's Supper together. We also look inward. We're called, the Apostle Paul says, to examine our hearts before we take the Lord's Supper so that we don't take it in an unworthy manner. So we're examining our hearts to see, are we walking, not sinlessly, because that was only Jesus, but are we walking in repentance and faith? The same way that you came into a relationship with God, repentance for your sin, faith that he died on the cross to cover your sin, is the same way that you live the Christian life on a daily basis. The entire Christian life, as Martin Luther says, is repentance and faith. And then lastly, we look forward. So Paul says that as we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So we look forward to the glorious day when Jesus will return and he will make all things new and he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes and we will celebrate uh, the great banquet of the Lamb uh, in the kingdom of God. So we look backward, outward, upward, inward, and forward. I thought that was helpful and I wanted to share that with you this morning. So let's take a moment just silently and uh, talk to God, uh, confess your sin, remember his grace, which covers it all, and then I'll pray and lead us through the elements. Heavenly Father, we uh, are so thankful that you are inviting us again today to receive grace for all of our imperfections and failings. And God, we thank you that we can look back and remember that at the cross you did something <laughs> that has future effects. You demonstrated your love then and you are still loving us now. So Jesus, we thank you for your great love, which led you to lay down your life for us. We thank you for your body and for your blood. We thank you for forgiveness, for the Holy Spirit, and for eternal life. God, we thank you that you walk with us through every single thing that we deal with in our lives, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that the work that you started in us, you will carry on to completion until the day that you return. And God, we look forward to that great day when we will see you face to face, when we will be embraced by our Savior and our God. Jesus, we love you. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and take the cracker out. Let's eat together. Apostle Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. He says, in the same way, after supper, uh, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's drink together.
Father, once again, I thank you that we are called, loved, and kept. That you will not lose a single one of us <laughs> who you've called to yourself. You were the good shepherd and you lay down at the gate to keep us safe. So, Father, I thank you that we can have the assurance of salvation. And, Father, I thank you that because of that, we can know today where we will spend eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you guys to respond with us in worship or uh, remain seated and praying however you wish to reflect on uh, yeah, the message this morning and, and the meaning of communion. Um, yeah. <coughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us both in person and online uh, to worship today. 
Uh, we invite you to come back next week. We're going to have a, a child dedication, so that'll be exciting. Um, I want you to hear this benediction from the end of the little epistle of Jude, Jude 24 and 25, as a famous sort of benediction. So I thought maybe we'd use that each week while we're in the book of Jude. It says this, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. If you'd like to receive prayer, there'll be people at the front with lanyards on that love to pray with, uh, with you. And please uh, feel free to sign up to volunteer for our garage sale. It's going to be a great time. Pray for sunshine. It should be a lot of fun. We'll see you next week, everyone. Mm -hmm.